Hi everybody and welcome to the Zen Palace Healing. In today's lesson, we're actually going to learn about hemorrhoids, something that is very crucial to a lot of people that they get later in life. But before we go on, I'd just like to remind you to subscribe and like the video so you can get more updates for upcoming videos in the following days. Alright, so without further ado, let's get started. Alright, so hemorrhoids, or aka piles, it's more of a common name that we know of. It actually comes from the Greek hemorrhoides, I guess that's how it's pronounced. Hemo means bleeding, and roides, here double line, means veins. So that's where it comes at, that's what the actual definition of hemorrhoids comes from. That's just a little fun fact. Alright, so let's get started more to the science behind pathophysiology. What is really going on? So the definition of a hemorrhoid is basically a venous dilation from increased pressure in two areas, superior hemorrhoidal plexus and the inferior hemorrhoidal plexus. And before we get into where are these plexus where where are these plexus? Which by the way, plexus is another name for net. A net of veins. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what congestion is, venous congestion. Okay, so normally, as we know, right here, we have blood that goes from artery to veins. It's being transferred. So when blood comes from arteries, it means that's, that's when the heart pushes the blood out to the body to deliver oxygen. So the oxygen is delivered to the tissues, and then the tissues give out carbon dioxide. And then the veins carry that blood with more carbon dioxide back to the lungs, so the lungs can oxygenate again, and the cycle just moves on again. However, with congestion, what's going on is that the movement of blood becomes stagnant. That's what congestion means, stagnant. So, as you can see in this little picture here, the veins are getting what they call dilated. They're getting bigger, they're getting stagnant, the blood is not moving as much as it should, and there's various reasons as to why that may be, but that is the actual um, pathophysiology. That is what's going on in this hemorrhoidal plexus. Okay, so let's get moving to what I what is what are these plexi? All right. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy, and this is more in the anatomy of the um, large intestine. So the large intestine goes to ascending colon, transverse colon, and then um, descending colon, and then it becomes the sigmoid colon, the rectum, and the anus, and that's where that's where feces come out. So here I'm gonna. Oh, sorry about that. There. Let's try again. Here is an R for the rectum, and then here is going to be the anus. And you see these little indentations right here? This is what's called the dentate line. So the dentate line is where, um, that's the separation between rectum and anus. And that's what's going to tell us whether the hemorrhoids are going to be either internal or external. Okay, so another way, dentate, it's just another, it's the Latin root for tooth. Because they look like tooth, tooth markations, tooth marks, right here. So, internal hemorrhoids are going to happen in this complex of veins. They're going to get congestion, and they're going to get large, and they're going to 
come out of the anus. With external hemorrhoids, the plexus are already out here in the anus region, below the dentate line. So you're going to be able to see an external hemorrhoid a lot sooner than an internal one. Okay? So anatomy again, but this is more of the side view. So we looked at a, uh, a frontal view, and this is more of a sagittal view, or more of a side view. Okay, so here, what we're going to do is circle this one right here, and this, we're going to have you and uh, learn that this is the internal plexus, and this out here, it's going to be the um, external hemorrhoidal plexus. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that these veins, this plexus, they go to the rectal vein and the pudendal. And then back to the iliac. And then right here between this internal and external, you're going to have the dentate line. And again, that's what makes the difference between an internal hemorrhoid and an external hemorrhoid. So I hope that makes sense. Now let's get to the clinical signs and symptoms, what you may be experiencing. So for external hemorrhoids, since it's easier to see and it's easier to feel, what you're going to feel actually are going to have, are going to be three things. First is a mass. It's usually a flesh color mass. Then you're going to have pain. Or you could have either pain could be either pulsating pain or a sharp pain like needles are being inserted and then you're gonna have bleeding it's usually not that much but you're gonna notice it after you have a bowel movement so keep an eye on that internal hemorrhoids however as I have a picture right here we're gonna a little uh, we're gonna chat a little bit about what they each do, what are the different stages. So normal, this is what we already talked about. The rectum and the anus, and then right here, the dentate line, okay? Internal hemorrhoids, stage one. Notice that the dentate line is below the internal plexus. Okay, so Signs and symptoms for stage one is usually symptomatic. You don't really feel them. So it's going to be difficult to know whether you're having, having stage one um, hemorrhoids or not, internal hemorrhoids. But with stage three, I'm um, sorry, stage two to four, you're going to have something called a prolapse. So a prolapse means a drop down. It means that this little plexite just drops out of the anus in all these stages. But the difference in stage two, three, and four is the following. Stage two, internal plexus, they drop after you have a bowel movement, but then they um, retract again. They go up to its original place again without doing anything. Stage three, however, they drop, but it won't go back by itself. Instead, you have to use your hands or another, another, um, helper. I mean, advice. Um, I'm sorry, tool <laughs> to bring back the hemorrhoids. But when it comes to stage four, you're going to bring it down. I mean, it's going to fall off the internal plexus and there's nothing that's going to bring it back. So that's when it's more of a critical and it's going to look more of an external hemorrhoid. All right. So differential diagnosis. What other things could it be? So because it's a mass, we as doctors, we always have to rule out cancer. We always have to make sure what, what, what kind of 
mask is it and we have to refer for cancer or we have to think in the back of our minds cancer could be a re an issue or a polyp which is another growth but it's more benign whereas cancer is malignant and again polyps can become cancers too just like benign cancers can become malignant if they're untreated. So rectal, it could be a rectal cancer, which means above the dentate line. Anal cancer, if it's below the dentate line, you're going to have an anal fissure. That's another diagnosis. That's another possibility, meaning an injury in the anus. Let me just put that there, injury and impacted feces. This comes with chronic constipation. And what impacted feces means is that um, the poop, the feces, they're getting stuck there. They're so hard like rocks that they're not coming off of the rectum. So that is also another uh, serious condition that needs to be addressed as well. So sequelae, what happens if it's untreated? What if these hemorrhoids are not being treated? Well, these are the risks. What well, could happen later? You can have an infection, which means you're going to have more inflammation and it's going to lead to more problems and more issues. Ulceration, meaning that they can break, they can have more injury, they can bleed more. And incontinence, you're not going to be able to have bowel movements as often as you like to. In fact, bowel movements may be very, very um, infrequent. So workup. What will a doctor do on a visit? First, of course, he's going to ask you the questions on your clinical symptoms, pretty much what we went over about the signs and symptoms of the mass, the pain, and the blood after a bowel movement. And of course, other things that are necessary to know. Rectal examination, as you can see right there, is inserting, the doctor is going to insert his fingers into your, into the anus and uh, feel the area to see where the mass is. So that will tell the doctor whether it's more internal, external, or it could be something else. And by the way, I'm just going to write a little bit of a blue here just to show that it's a, he's wearing gloves. I don't know why that picture is not wearing gloves. It's not cool. And anoscopy. So an anoscopy is this little device that's also inserted into the anus and it's about 10 centimeters. And that will give a good visual of the anus and a little bit of the rectum. So enough to see whether uh, the hemorrhoids are internal or external. So conventional treatments. So first thing that the doctor may recommend is cryotherapy, which is a type of cold laser therapy that's going to shrink and reduce um, the size of the hemorrhoids. Sclerotic injection. That is a type of a solution that they needle the hemorrhoids with and sclero and, and sclerosis. Well, sclerosis, it's another word for narrowing. So it makes the hemorrhoids narrow, the veins narrow, so they can be retracted and it can help. And it can go back to its original position. If you're having internal hemorrhoids, the doctor may do a rubber ligation, which means it's going to put a rubber band around the hemorrhoids. And that will shrink the outside components, the outside veins of, of the inflammation. Or IR photocoagulation, which is another device to help shrink the hemorrhoids and reduce the inflammation. Uh, also, the, the doctor may address to avoid constipation, avoid straining when doing 
Number two, avoid prolonged sitting and increase fiber intake. So naturopathic treatments, a doctor, what a naturopathic doctor will do. So he'll definitely address lifestyle modification because that is the biggest thing that needs to be addressed, first of all. More fiber, more fluids, and something that we call a seat bath, where it's like this um, seat, sitting device, sort of a sauna that only covers, that covers your whole body, uh, excluding your head. Other treatments, more from the plant world, it's going to be something called horse chestnut or in Latin, Asculus hyposcastanum. So indications, like why would you use this? The naturopath will know that there's weakness in the connective tissue. Connective tissue is what veins are made of. So if veins are weak, it means the connective tissue is weak. That's why the botanicals of horse chestnut will be indicated for this. Homeopathically, however, hemorrhoids are going to be more with the symptoms of burning in the anus with chills up and down. Another plant that's, that's been shown to help with the hemorrhoids is something called witch hazel or Hamamelis virginiana, which is kind of popular here in the East Coast, at least in Pennsylvania where I am. So, botanically, horse chestnut is going to have, the indications is going to be hemorrhoids with weight and fullness and rectal prolapse. Venous debility, meaning weakness in the veins, with relaxed and full tissues. So, kind of similar to um, horse chestnut. Homeopathically, hemorrhoids are going to bleed profusely and soreness. So that's going to be the homeopathic one. And this is a picture of the um, witch hazel. All right, so something different and it's from a different perspective. Um, more from a Eastern Oriental medicine like Tibetan, Ayurveda and Chinese they might address hemorrhoids to be coming from um, liver, a liver issue. Hence, I put the liver right here. So, in these medicines, the liver, what I understand is it makes the blood, it purifies the blood. And of course, if the blood is, is not clean, there's going to be issues in the arteries and the veins. And you're not going to have enough nutrition for all the different tissues. Similarly, in these medicines, um, hemorrhoids do come from a liver issue. So, what they recommend is to avoid hot and sour foods because they aggravate the liver, limit spices and oils, again because those are hot, hot foods and hemorrhoids is more of a hot condition, it's an inflammation. So you're going to aggravate it with them. Eat more rice with boiled vegetables. Vegetables boiled are always a good thing to have in the diet for any kind of inflammation. Lentils, obviously for the source of fiber. And meat broth. And I believe that's actually to help with the, the circulation and the blood itself. So that's just another way to look at it for your treatments of the piles. Now this mind-body medicine, I added this more from my understanding of how hemorrhoids can be, you can do something about your hemorrhoids even right this moment to try just controlling your breath and do this technique. So what it is, you're going to do is just lay down, go outside, take a deep breath, and then I want you to do five full breaths. And then imagine for the the throat area, a line 
going all the way to the rectum. And here I'm going to make it on the back. And then here's roughly the area of the rectum. So as you breathe in deeply, I want you to take deep, full abdominal breaths five times. And then just imagine this line. And that should help at least ease some of the pain and hopefully some of the inflammation as well as in the hemorrhoids. Okay. So that concludes our presenta the presentation on the hemorrhoids and I hope you have a better understanding of what they are and what you can do about them. If you have further questions on how to treat hemorrhoids, how to use natural treatments, and how it can help you with your condition, please don't forget to email me on the description below, make one. Thank you and until next time. And don't forget to subscribe for more updates. Thank you. Bye-bye.